Hello and welcome back to the 8-Bit Guy. So in this episode, I'm going to be doing a restoration on this Apple RGB monitor. Now, normally I don't get too excited about monitors. I mean, to me, they're kind of like a RAM chip or a hard drive or something. They're just kind of a generic item, unless they are a matching monitor that goes with a specific system. And in this case, this monitor is the matching monitor for the LC series of Macintosh computers. Now I'm going to be doing an episode in a couple of weeks that heavily involves the LC series computer, so I wanted to have a matching monitor. So uh, Nate Spencer, who's a friend of mine, donated this to me, and supposedly it works, but it needs a lot of cleaning and some retrobrite and whatnot. But uh, when I'm done with it, I'll have my matching monitor so I can go ahead with that um, episode that I'm going to do. Now, as an interesting coincidence, you've actually seen this LC2 before. Uh, in fact, you saw it exactly two years ago. I did an episode called Adventures in Retrobrite. And in this episode, I explored a variety of different ways to possibly retrobrite things. But one of the things I did was it was also the first episode where I featured my black crate and I did the submersion method outside in the sun with uh, uh, the hot uh, hydrogen peroxide. And uh, that method has worked more or less flawlessly for me for the last two years. And this was the very first computer that... I actually used that method on. And here it is two years later, and it still looks great. Um, so I'm very happy about that. Uh, this computer needs a hard drive, so I'm not. I'm going to have to do a little work on this computer too. But um, aesthetically speaking, it still looks great, especially compared to what it looked like before, which, as you can see, it was absolutely terrible um, two years ago before I did the, the restoration on it. In fact, if you look at the back of it, you can still see that one little port cover that I never actually retrobrited, and you can see uh, the stark contrast between uh, what has and has not been retrobrited. And like I said, two years have passed, and there's been uh, no re-yellowing that I can see, so I'm real happy with that. So anyway, um, first thing we're going to do is plug this thing up. So I just want to confirm before we start that the monitor works. Okay, so it looks like the monitor's working fine, so... Uh, Let's get started. Although, before we go too far, I want to show you something. Uh, it seems like my LC2 is technically working, but uh, take a listen to this horrible sound it's making. Yep, uh, that squealing is actually coming from the speaker itself. Here, I'll unplug it so you can see. So, this is something I need to look into after finishing the monitor. So let's take a closer look at this monitor. It's pretty yucky looking. It doesn't look too bad at a distance, but up close you can see it's pretty gross. And if you sit it on top of the LC2, you can see it is definitely yellowed and does not match. Now, the first thing I'm going to do is remove this microphone holder. I've always found these irritating and I have no plans to use one of those microphones. Um, these things are just held on by double sided tape and I'm going to try peeling it off with my fingers. I, I don't want to risk damaging the plastic by using a screwdriver or something. Ah. There we go. And with any luck, I can gently pull this tape off and maybe leave no residue. You can also see the original color of the monitor underneath. Step one, as usual, is just some Windex to clean off the dirt. It's actually amazing how much gunk this takes off quickly. And uh, then this happened. Yeah, well, I guess I should say this is not real Windex, it's a generic Sam's Club window cleaner. I guess the plastic isn't made so well. Time for some alcohol to see if it will remove the remaining gunk, such as this stuff here. I think it's leftover adhesive from something. And not only does it remove it, but the original color of the monitor is now revealed under the gunk, so uh, that gunk's been on there a long time. Wow, uh, this monitor already looks so much better just from a good cleaning, but uh, I still plan to retrobrite it because I still don't like that it doesn't match the computer. Oh, and there's another problem I noticed. If you look at the bottom here, you'll see it's missing all four rubber feet, so I'll have to find some feet. And now to work on these side vents. I say vents, they're just cosmetic lines really, but uh, there's crud built up in them. I'll brush as much stuff out as I can. Uh, Later on, I can hit this with a water sprayer outside and hopefully get anything left over. Here's another trick I do on stuff like this. I'll just use a screwdriver combined with a paper towel to get the stubborn dirt out. <laughs> anyway, yeah, that looks uh, noticeably better. Now time to deal with these rubber feet. Uh, there's leftover adhesive in these rectangular areas, so I'll put some WD-40 in there and let it sit for a few minutes. 
I'll also get this little area next to the foot. And uh, I don't mind using a screwdriver in these spots since if I scratch the plastic, nobody will ever see it once I put the new feet in there. Okay, so far so good. Okay, now I'm going to start disassembling this thing. The only two screws I see are these here on the bottom, so I'll start by removing these. And this is really an annoying angle to try to remove screws. Anyway, it looks like I can separate the bottom a little, but uh, I can't figure out how to go any further. So I'll take a look at the service guide. In this photo, it shows I'm supposed to push down this area while pulling back. Well, that doesn't make a lot of sense to me, but I'll give it a try. Okay, I see how it works now. Okay, and there we go. So the very first thing I always do when working on a CRT is to discharge the tube. Interestingly enough, I have so far never encountered a tube that had any noticeable charge on it. I suspect because most of the tubes I've worked on are later model ones that have bleeder resistors inside to discharge it after power off. And this one also has no spark, but at least I have the peace of mind of knowing for sure that it is discharged. And another ritual of mine is to double check the flyback is discharged by tapping the anode cup to the chassis. Now, whether that accomplishes anything, I don't know, but I do it anyway. So it appears they have this monitor divided up into two major boards. Now this bottom board down here, this is like the power board. This is where all the uh, high voltage electronics goes. Then this is actually the board that's plugged directly into the back of the CRT here that handles all of the signaling from the actual computer and uh, displaying it on the screen. I'm this has actually got some uh, like goop here or something that's uh, connecting that and I don't want to have to cut through that. So I think I can actually leave this board on here on the back and just try to unplug everything for this bottom board and get it out because the bottom board unfortunately has to come out. Okay, so the first thing I do before disassembling something like this is to take many high resolution photos of this thing from many different angles. And that way if there's any question later where some wire goes, well, I'll have a good record. Now it's time to start unplugging things. Unfortunately, I realized I was going to have to remove that rear board too. And there's this goop I need to cut, or at least I thought I did. In retrospect, I feel pretty dumb about this now, and if you haven't noticed why, you'll see why shortly. Unfortunately, the further I went along, I realized there were more and more things uh, I was going to have to disassemble. And this job was becoming more complex by the minute. So eventually, I realized this rear board wasn't glued on, but uh, rather there's a release mechanism. You just rotate this white knob and then it slides out easily. And I guess I haven't seen a setup like this before and that's why I didn't realize um, how that worked. Unfortunately, there was still this one wire at each end that was connecting this smaller board. It appeared I could remove it by prying this plastic piece open. <laughs> However, I was extremely irritated to find out it was soldered in place. So I decided for the time being just to leave it attached and set the smaller board to the side. And now, time to continue trying to get the larger board out. When I first took this piece out here, I was actually really stumped as to what this thing was. I was, I was thinking, is this the flux capacitor? <laughs> and then I realized these little cylinders are actually the brightness and contrast knobs that stick out the side of the monitor. Okay, time to see if I have everything unplugged. Hopefully this whole bottom piece will come out. And it does. It's kind of dusty, so I'll hit it with some compressed air. All of the caps look good, and since it was working fine before I took it apart, I don't plan to mess with any of this. And of course, here's the tube that I need to remove in order to get the front bezel off to Retrobrite. The tube itself is held in by four large screws, and um, the tube itself is a little hard to get a hold of, and uh, there's a large degaussing cable that's making it stick to the bezel. Nevertheless, I got it out. Phew, that was a lot of work. Uh, Parafractic's light brighting technique is starting to look a lot more attractive. And before you ask, I do plan to try that at some point, but not on this item. I mean, it seems like it works, but I want to test it on something I don't care about first and just do some more research on it. As usual, it seems the day I want to do this, it's total overcast outside. However, the forecast for the rest of the week is very promising for Retrobrite. First, let me apologize for the overexposed picture. I had my exposure set manually and I couldn't see the screen out in the bright sun. Um, let me grab the temperature here this morning. It's already 118 degrees and hopefully that will rise another 20 or 30 degrees throughout the day. Mm. 
Ok, uh, there we go, and I'll just recover it here, and now we wait. Ok, so it's late evening and it's time to check on this. I only got about 6 hours of sunlight due to me getting a late start on this and probably only 3 or 4 hours of direct sunlight. Nevertheless, it does look better, and as I'm drying it off inside, I can see the top part is still yellowed. I can also still see a contrast between the exterior and interior parts of the plastic, but I'd like to see how much progress was actually made, so I will compare to the rest of the monitor like this. And uh, yeah, I can definitely see some improvement, but uh, it's not done yet. So the next morning I decided to get an earlier start on this, and uh, overnight the water temperature fell to 88 degrees. Another problem this has is that I have more water in here than usual because this is a taller object, so it takes longer to heat it up. So I'm going to help speed that up a bit by pouring in some boiling water. And that has increased our temperature to 107 degrees. And um, now I'll put the bezel back in for another day's worth of Retrobrite. Ok, so we've reached the end of the second day. Time to take it out. So far, looks pretty great. I'll need to rinse off all the peroxide. After drying it off, it looks pretty darn good, but uh, I'm seeing a weird spotted pattern on the top here. Now, one thing I've learned over the years is that you have to give plastics um, a good hour after removing from the solution to see what it's really going to look like. Uh, so hopefully these spots will disappear. But even if they don't, they are very faint. And here's what it looks like compared to the rest of the monitor. And so this is some of the unexpected weirdness that can happen anytime you're retro bright. First of all, on the top, I thought there was going to be this weird pattern that I showed earlier when it was still kind of wet. And once it dried out, that pattern is gone, but now there's a very slight streaked pattern, looks like from where I was wiping it, which makes no sense. But this is what I'm more concerned about. Uh, I don't know if you can see it on the camera, but there's this little section about so wide. And I know exactly what caused that. At one point during the retro bright, I found this thing had floated to the top in this corner was slightly out of the water and so it did not get treated as much. So I'm going to go put it back in there again today and we'll see what happens. Ok, so I went and put this out for another day and you can still sort of just barely see that spot there and it might be possible to get it out uh, by putting it out there again but I just don't have any more time to wait on this and it's so minor I'm just, I'm just not going to worry about it. So time to start reassembling. Okay, time to test it. Well, nothing blew up. Now I'll power on the computer. And good news everyone, it seems to still be working. Now it's time to start on the rear piece. This will be the largest item I've ever retrobrighted in the crate. Um, I'll start by spraying these vents really well to get any remaining dirt out of those. So one problem I deal with a lot is the formation of bubbles due to the reaction on the plastic. And these bubbles, after a while, tend to make the plastics float to the top. This can be a problem. However, in this case, I'm going to stick this brick in here, which should eliminate that concern. And since this thing is much taller, I'm going to have to add a lot more water. Now, I'm concerned about two things. 
By adding a lot more water, I'll be diluting the hydrogen peroxide. And another problem is the water temperature. It'll take longer for the sun to heat this up. In fact, I had to put so much water in here just to get the tip top of this thing submerged. There's no room at all for the greenhouse effect. So I'll just remove the plastic wrap here completely. In fact, this still doesn't want to completely submerge. So I'm going to have to rotate it around the other way since the crate is on a slight incline. And I'll add an additional bottle of peroxide. I let this sit out for the rest of the day, which was just a few hours, and then the entire rest of the next day. I did come out every few hours and try to eliminate these bubbles, and I also kept my eye out on the temperature. It stayed pretty warm, but it never got quite as hot as it did with uh, less water. In fact, by the end of the second day, temperature only reached 101 degrees. I thought about getting my sous vide cooker out, but uh, I could tell the color was improving despite the lower temperature, so I just left it alone. And so here we are, a day and a half later. So drying it off, I can already tell this looks so much better. Um, I'll go ahead and reassemble it and see if it matches the front bezel. Yeah, uh, I think it's going to look great. Now I'll screw it back together. I also took a trip to the hardware store and found some feet, which I am hopeful will fit. So uh, here goes. And look at that, a perfect fit. And let's have a look at it on top of the LC2. It definitely matches well. Uh, keep in mind that the worst of the yellowing was on the top of the monitor, so even when I showed the comparison earlier, the contrast between the computer and monitor didn't look terribly bad, but it really didn't paint a good picture of how yellow it was. Uh, still, when you look at the picture I took before and after, <laughs> you can definitely tell some difference. I also managed to borrow a working hard drive solution for this. And uh, speaking of the LC2, I said I was going to recap it. And I'd hoped to show that in this video, but it turns out I ordered the wrong caps. These are the correct values, but they are not the correct size. If these were traditional caps with wire leads on them, it might not have mattered, but uh, since they're surface mount, I really need them to be the right size. So I've had to reorder the caps, but they won't be here for several more days. So I won't be able to show you the recapping. Okay guys, so if you're still with me, uh, this is probably not the most exotic thing that I've ever uh, retrovided before, but it is something that's kind of important to see how to do, you know, what's necessary to tear down one of these monitors and put them all back together. And amazingly, this one still works. Uh, but you may be wondering, well, what's this special episode? that I'm going to be doing that I needed the LC system for. Well, if you notice, this thing is running the Oregon Trail right now. Now, that's not the Macintosh version of the Oregon Trail. That's actually the Apple IIe version of the Oregon Trail. And the reason it's able to do this is because there's a special card inside this LC2 um, which allows it to fully emulate an Apple IIe. And uh, this is a really fascinating piece of equipment, and that's what the next episode is going to be about uh, that I needed the LC2 for. So anyway, uh, stick around for that episode, and... Thanks for watching.